laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know, what, don't know whether you noticed, but I um, passed my health check on oh my God, you have. myself this week. My, For the yeah. first time. It, it said, you, you went away briefly, and it said, health check passed, you are ready to record. <laughs> well, we know what the real disease is. But people, people are listening not, to this who have no idea what we're talking about. They're like, is Dan okay? Yeah. <laughs> I am, apparently. <laughs> yeah, Dan is now fine. Don't worry about it. I am fine. How uh, are you, Jack? Are you fine? Um, yeah, I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm doing fine. We, for the listener, Dan and I were just uh, uh, reminiscing, not reminiscing, talking about, um, uh, yeah, just, you know, inflation, well, not inflation, but just like economics. It's not easy, is it, at the moment? Things, not very easy, not very good, uh-huh. one would say. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Everybody's struggling. But everybody does seem to be struggling. Well, I know some people who aren't struggling, but you know what I say? Good for them. And they've worked <laughs> hard for it. And, you know, it's all. And, uh, and um, yeah. To the guillotine with them. <laughs> yeah, <whoa. laughs> yeah, I don't know. What yeah, I don't know. The world the world seems to be very strange. I will say I'm extremely excited. I've never been excited about a presidential election before, Dan, but I'm getting <laughs> stoked for the Republican primaries. It's just gonna be insane. Like I think I'd heard people last round be like the Republicans are really destroying themselves, but it's like you know, like if you just look at the raw numbers, like yeah, they're doing fine with Trump because the same people who voted are always going to vote. But it's like this time around, I could eat, I could eat my words, but like, it does seem like it's a bit of a shit show. I kind of do just feel like Trump's just going to wipe the floor with everybody, but you never know. Mm. We'll see. We'll see. Do you mean? Do you mean? Because I'm not really following it. Do you mean that um, there might be a sort of implosion in the vote share that they get, or you think it's just? No, might... I no, I just mean in the primaries, just in terms of sure. like some people split and go for like DeSantis or something like that. Even though, I don't know, I just feel like as soon as you put him and Trump on a stage together, he's just going to seem like such a duck. Like, I don't know. I don't DeSantis know. We'll see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's exciting. It's the one sort of like uh, saving grace. The one thing we have to look forward to is yeah. all the sort of like the comedic of value. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, the 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 continued decline and crisis of uh, the uh, the the political situation in the United States. Yeah. Fun times. Fun times. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Shame. The um, I, it's funny. I I found myself like back home. There's like a very obvious aesthetic to like the chuds. You know what I mean? And it was always very obvious to me growing up. You know, it's like guys who have like Blue Lives Matter flags, and it's they were just like American flags in general, and like you know, just pricks basically is what I'm saying. Like you can tell who these people are and blah, 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 blah. But it's funny because I've really only started recently to be able to kind of like recognize those people out here in the UK. And it's been funny to me because I've been kind of partially like, um, man, they're just, there are, there are a lot of assholes in England. A lot of, some of these people, they're just real assholes. And then I've been like, part of me has been a bit kind of like nostalgic for back home. And then I'm like, what the fuck am I talking about? If I go back home, it's just like insane, <laughs> like Trump guys or like liberals. It's like, yeah, I don't know. I don't really know where I'm going with this, but uh, crazy people in both countries is I suppose what I'm there saying. Are some, there are some crazy people here. We had a few of the crazies in Cornwall this past weekend. There was, really? a, was a, what were they doing? It was some kind of, um, there was a very seemingly quite poorly attended uh, uh, right wing fascist rally to protests really? yeah i don't know they um to protest uh the i don't know there's a hotel that's being used to house some oh, refugees God. because we have this crisis at the moment where um uh, asylum seekers the process of seeking asylum in this country is being so made i think deliberately laborious to just continue having this be a political story that the conservatives can keep pointing to and kicking occasionally to drum up some support for themselves. So obviously um, there are a large number of asylum seekers housed in a hotel, I think in Newquay it was, and um, Mm. there was a a protest by the far right and a much larger, fortunately much larger counter demo by um, uh, by anti-fascist protesters so good for them good for them well done for going i wasn't able to go the reason why i bring this up i suppose is sort of like to um point out that we have some of the same crazies here and some of the same narratives are clearly at play here as they are amongst the sort of like growing fringe right in the u.s i suppose yeah Uh, but on a more practical level that what it made me 
ask was just how is it that the right seems to be able to spread these sort of ludicrous narratives and have people catch on to them and we can't come up with anything that's like comparable yeah like to convince people that well no actually <laughs> here's yeah. your enemy and you should be mad at them kind of thing like in a simplistic and explainable way even if it even if on a technical a theoretical level what we would be uh popularizing even if it weren't i don't know strictly like correct on a sort of like mm. um sure uh, like still you can't come up with anything you know mm. but then, yeah, I, I then it's not just a criticism it's like I don't know. yeah it's mad thing. and i mean there were protests like that around here all over the uk protests just like assholes showing up to like hotels to get mad at people who are just minding their own business and like are very tired from like the harrowing journey that they had to do because i will remind everybody there is no legal way to seek asylum in the uk so the only way that these people can do it is by like risking their lives to get here by those people which which is the legal way yeah, 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 exactly. That is the legal way. <laughs> the legal way is to, like, find a boat and, like, <laughs> risk your life getting to this island. So, yeah. But the one the one thing I will say is that, like, the, the left has those. It just doesn't capitalize on them. And when I say capitalize, like, what does that even mean? Because, you know, the Black Lives Matter protests and everything like that, what was that if not a working class movement? And, I mean, of course, it, it wasn't, like, exp- you know, there were no like workers councils or whatever. Like it wasn't an explicitly like 20th century, like working class movement. But, um, you know, if the working class is going to be this like universal emancipator, um, the black lives matter movement is like, you know, that's, that's a working class movement. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I suppose why I bring up the universal thing is because obviously there are like people of color who are affected by, you know, racial segregation or racial profiling in police who are not working class and we need to emancipate those people as well but you know it's easy it's easy to get down in the dumps and be like man like 20 assholes showed up to like the holiday inn to protest these like nice families you know what i mean and what can we do well you know most of them got like counter protested pretty effectively and like there are these working class movements everywhere it's just a matter of like trying to organize them so that's like at least my saving grace because like it is easy to be just like a jerk and be like, but what about the workers' councils? There were no workers' councils. It's like the working class movement is all around, and like, I don't know, just because it doesn't look like you know like the Leninist model of like a mass political party doesn't mean that it's not there, you know. But, sure, and I mean I um, maybe we what we don't want maybe it's not a an admirable model to have um, some <laughs> sort of <laughs> crank. <laughs> uh, theoretical perspective spread on the internet to a load of individuals who are otherwise not particularly well connected to one another and then yeah. be able to get a very small admittedly very small uh, number of them to come out to a series of fringe events that are not particularly like effective or significant so um, yeah maybe it, you, make, you make me realise maybe I'm wrong to at least even wonder whether this is a positive model i suppose yeah well it's maddening nonetheless yeah. it's like i don't know getting people out in the streets it's you know difficult <laughs> and it's so stupid that it's like that's what they're getting people out in the streets for it's like just go home <laughs> like live your like fine petty bourgeois lives instead of like you know throwing eggs at immigrants i don't know i say this as an immigrant so you know i can't you know confirmed bias here but mm-hmm. what are you gonna do there have been so many times out here well so many times but like where someone I'll be talking to that I don't really know too well will like bring up some questionable politics in regards to immigration out here. And they just, it, it just doesn't cross their mind that it's like, well, yeah, I'm an immigrant too, dude. And it's not like I'm going to be like, I have the same life story as like someone fleeing the Syrian <laughs> civil war or something like that. But like, it's so obvious when it's just like, and you, it's, it's really good to confront them and just be like, well, why, why don't, you know, why, why am I not that? why am I not bad? And they go, Oh, well, yeah, well, you know, uh, you know, and it's like, I do know, I know exactly what you're saying. I'm like a pasty white guy. That's why you think it's okay. You know? So whatever. Uh, yeah. an American immigrant is a whole different kind of bad. Joke. <laughs> yeah. I am. They appreciate me because I'm decolonizing and yeah. desettling the United States. They go, <laughs> excellent. Thank you for your service, Jack. Um, all right. Uh, speaking of, not looking at outdated models at all, Dan. Should we uh <laughs> should we get into today's reading? Yeah, why not? Why not? Um 
All right. Well, we, yeah, yeah. I, I really enjoyed this. And, you know, we might find that it actually isn't too outdated. I'm shuffling a lot of papers. Hopefully you can't hear that. Um, today, Dan, we read two things. Um, one was a George Comneenal essay, friend of the show. We read his Rethinking the French Revolution uh, pretty recently, actually, for the show. Very good book. Um, it's an essay of his called Marx and the Politics of the First International. It was written in 2014. And then you had the idea, Dan, which I think wound up being a really good one to read the Marx's inaugural address to the First International or to the International Working Men's Association in kind of tandem with that. So we read two things this time. Um, I enjoyed it because they were both relatively short, especially <laughs> Marx's. Very short is a welcome reprieve from things that we've done recently. But um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed these. Obviously, I think that they um, complemented each other pretty well. A primary source. We're actually reading Marx for once. And um, yeah, I don't know. What were your thoughts? Yeah, I was I was delighted, particularly with the communal essay. Um, it really, it's a great synthesis of history and economics and politics. Um, it's short, but uh, more importantly, quite concise and to the point, and it really does give you the facts and the key players. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about his ultimate um, uh, conclusion, but we can get to that later on. But uh, generally, um, a thoroughly enjoyable and to be highly recommended piece, I think. Yeah, I think I think maybe we maybe well I mean we'll almost certainly go off the tracks immediately, but maybe we start <laughs> with Marx's piece and just kind of go over it quickly. So it is exactly what it sounds like. It's Marx's inaugural address that was written, um, I believe, also as a pamphlet for the beginning of the first international, what we now know as the first international, the International Working Men's Association in 1864. Um, and I, some things that kind of just stood out to me, this is kind of supposed to be like their game plan, right? Like how we're going to get workers to hop on board, um, what we're, you know, what our goals are, what we think, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, I was pretty impressed by like how it seemed to be fairly typical Marx in that it was 50% like moral arguments like humanist arguments against like here's why things are bad here's why you've been lied to your concrete experience blah 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 and then the latter half is like his logical slash maybe like historical arguments against capitalism and um in favor of maybe socialism or something like that and you know it ends with the line that we've heard in the at the end of the um, manifesto proletarians vote countries unite but um I really appreciated that. And it, it was very stirring. And obviously you heard it here first, like Marx is a good writer. He like knows how to, uh, you know, get you stoked or whatever, but it wasn't one or the other. It wasn't just pure moralism. This is bad. Let's get something else. And it wasn't just pure, like, um, no moralism at all, dude. Uh, this is science. Uh, it was, it was a bit of both. And I think if you are trying to write for like a working class audience, you could do a lot worse than use that as your model. Yeah, definitely um it's it's funny isn't it reading that it's it's clearly very clear to him the ex well it, it sort of starts with this exposition of how bad the lot of the working class is at the moment and sort of goes through quite a lot of both um like sort of facts and figures to sort of fill that out but also sort of like quotes from various people and also he sort of like explains how well the the bourgeois class are doing particularly in england all of his sort of analysis of the situation seems to be located in england and then toward the end he seems to he implies that sort of like um that's generally because england is sort of like the most advanced capitalist country i think um but it's also written in the shadow of this long period of i guess working class retreat um or the sort of lack of a uh, a sort of working class counterpower to the the bourgeois hegemony that's been going on ever since the end of eight, the end of the failure of the revolutions in 1848, and I guess the sort of collapse of chartism in the in Britain as well. Um, so it's interesting to sort of compare that situation to now, right, where you've got this protracted uh, worsening of the lot of the working class, um, without there being a noticeable sort of like reaction a noticeable political working class movement i suppose um and i guess that's why he jumps on to the the first international the international working men's association with such vigor and that's one of the things common points out is quite how committed marx is to this movement um as being a really important sign of a sort of rejuvenation of uh the working class yeah i i liked how he framed it at the beginning 
of an argument that we hear all the time now, which is just like the rising tide, rising tide lifts all boats or whatever, you know what I mean? Or he's like, you know, 20 years ago, we were told just let the capitalists accumulate or whatever, and there will be so much wealth, everyone will have everything they want. And then he goes, but actually, in reality, like things have gotten much worse for working class people. While, you know, Jeff Bezos, senior, 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 or whatever is like, you know, stacking his bills in like a Scrooge McDuck style uh, bank vault or something like that. And it's, it, it's just it's just very like, oh, yeah, that's an argument we hear now. And it's an argument you hear workers make now, right? It's like this kind of self um, justifying ideology of like, yeah, my job sucks. I go into it every day. I'm getting stolen from, but just, you know, let my, let, let the boss make money and then we'll do better. We might get like a 1% pay rise. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, and then he can't, oh, yeah, go ahead. He almost sort of breaks down in almost like Bernie, Bernie Sanders style rhetoric about mm. like the numbers of, the, the relative wealth of the billionaires or the relative wealth of the there weren't any billionaires at this time right <laughs> the, <laughs> the relative growth in wealth or the quantity of the wealth of britain that's held by such a ridiculously small number of people and he talks about like the 50 people who pay over a certain quantity yeah. of tax kind of thing and like um it's funny bernie sanders has been in the uk recently so he keeps pop- popping up mm. on on my youtube and this kind of thing of quotes and it's all that isn't it like Three, three people own how much of the proportion of the u.s uh, gdp or whatever and uh, yeah absolutely it's funny it's funny that you bring that up because i was actually pretty kind of like stoked that he came over here and i think that i don't know if the guy fuck i forgot the guy's name but the guy smalls or something like that who organized one of the first amazon strikes in america i think he met with corbin and they might have all met together that's pretty cool. That's awesome. Because it's like one of the things Bernie got criticized for was not being international enough. And it's like, okay, wow, big leap going from like one imperial power to the next. Wow, good for you. But still pretty cool. And I mean, just to see Bernie meeting with Corbin and meeting with the Smalls, Christian Smalls, Chris Smalls, something like that. It's pretty fucking cool. Um, and I that's kind of like the basis of this entire, of everything we read, right? Is this idea of internationalism. And it's interesting because, you know, you say that like, a long period had passed between the revolutions of 1848 their failure and when marx is writing but it's literally it's closer or it isn't it <laughs> yeah exactly it's like it's closer to long. them than 9 11 <laughs> was to years. us yeah. yeah exactly if i've done my yeah, yeah. math correctly which i'm not entirely <laughs> certain i have checked that for us listeners i had to subtract two numbers it was very difficult but you know it 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 just kind of goes to show, I, this is going to be a bit of a leap, but remember when we were reading The Devil's Chessboard, that classic work of Marxist <laughs> uh, uh, history, and we were just surprised because we ha- we went into it thinking of, you know, uh, the post-war compact between capital and labor, and it took a while, it took until the 70s for that to be really shipped away, but in reading the history of Alan Dulles's life, it became pretty apparent that like day one of the new deal capitalists were like working to constant to like chip away and to get rid of this compact. Right. Kind of made me think of that, but in reverse, right. It's like when we periodize history is like, okay, there was 1848 and then there was the commune and then there was this, and then there was that it's, we kind of forget about everything in between, but it's important to realize that um, class struggle doesn't stop. And it, it doesn't, it's not like socialist uh, politics really go anywhere. Well, I should say class struggle isn't going anywhere. Socialist politics might go somewhere. But um, the, the energy that supplies socialist politics, that if you want to call it like spontaneity or whatever, like that's always there. You know what I'm saying? So Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, Marx does end his introduction or his inaugural address with these um, sort of two high watermarks of the the class struggle from the point of view of the proletariat that have happened in the recent um, past relative to when this was written. Uh, one, the the passing of the 10-hour bill in the UK Parliament, which we talked about a little bit when we were reading Fossil Capital, um, and also the sort of growth of the cooperative movement in Britain, um, both of which he's somewhat sanguine about, I think. Um, but still, as you say, they are sort of like, representative of an ongoing class struggle you know whether it's political and reformist or whether it's um out and out revolutionary which was a little while to come yet from the standpoint of uh, 1864 when this was written uh just because it takes different forms doesn't mean that that struggle isn't ongoing i suppose and we saw reading fossil capital that there's just been this protracted like his- there was this the the history of industrial action and strike action um in 
the industrial centers of England was a constant feature of that period of time kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's interesting too seeing what frames the like working class struggles of these periods though, because Marx kind of talks a little bit about, and Comnenal talks a bit about it as well, that like people weren't necessarily talking about like getting rid of wage labor or whatever so much back then as like foreign policy issues. And it's really fascinating hearing them talk about the working class response in England to the American civil war and about how Marx makes the point where you is like, you know, don't believe the ruling class when they say it was their like enlightened attitudes on society and life and the equality of man that led them not to join the war on the side of the Confederates. They wanted to, it was the trade union council getting together and be like, we're absolutely not fucking doing this. Um, it was the working class that basically stopped English intervention on the side of the Confederates in the civil war. But basically come needle and Marx, you know, bring that up to say that this is one of the big issues of the day. And the international was formed in part to basically engage with these working class politics on a day-to-day -day level that aren't explicitly revolutionary or at least that aren't in revolutionary times right um and i think that's the fascinating thing about all of this because that's the question right it's like well what do you do in downtime i mean what do you do in not downtimes but also what do you do like now you know so it's, it's interesting to actually get you know daddy marx's take on it all so yeah 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 and it's, it's really really important that you bring up that point i suppose because um one of the things that's often said about this in all the address and Com Needle talks about it quite a lot, um, is how what it represents is Marx's continued and constant commitment to building the political autonomy of the working class. And in some ways, that's kind of like a synthesis between these two ideas of like being in revolutionary times or being in sort of like reformist and non-revolutionary times is that regardless of what whichever of those is happening, like look to how you build the political independence of the working class and sort of that's how you advance positively the class struggle. And that seems to be like Marx's key political outlook or strategy. Um, and it seems that's the sort of the reason why he engages this organization. Um, not from a reformist or revolutionary standpoint, but like endorsing things that are seemingly reformist strategies um, because they advance the greater goal of class autonomy, I guess. Yeah. And, th and that's a point that we've come across like several times before, right? Which is like in quote unquote down times, you can do a lot worse than just making people's lives better because that, there, there were like two, two portions of this. And it kind of mirrors Marx's like humanist scientific kind of as aspects of his thinking, right? Where it's like you in down times, you want to be able to develop on one hand, the capabilities of the working class so that it will be able to successfully overthrow capitalism and its historic goal of, you know, doing socialism and ending class society on one hand. Uh, and on the other, you just want to make things better for people. And I, you know, this is where like McNair comes in and I find him like very helpful because he solves that by being the question of like, how do you not become a reformist by just saying, you can always support measures that will benefit the working class and improve their lot. But you can, if it was safe, it was raised by like the Democrats or the Labour Party, you can never support that party, you know? And it's like, oh, well, there you go. So yeah, I, I really like that. It's like these two, I mean, this is going to sound so obvious to people that haven't just had like brain rot from reading theory for several years, but it's like, yeah, help people and then look towards the future. <laughs> it's like, wow, what a concept. <laughs> but it's also like, um, I guess, help people to help themselves, help people to organize their campaigns. And the way sort of Comnenal um, begins his analysis of the first internationalist to say it was a thoroughly um, working class institution. The initiative came from working class movements, whether it's like the trade unions movement in um, Britain, which is the, which is one of the sort of more pivotal elements of it. Um, like Marx wasn't looking for a working class organization to uh, join or to aid. Marx was trying to re finish capital, which. <laughs> <laughs> and we kind of wish he would have just done that. We've just honestly. done that, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe his, his uh, talents would have been better served. I don't know. <laughs> um, no, that's not true because I think um, one of the things that's really important to reiterate about Marx, he was first and foremost a politi political activist before anything else. And that's what. Um, these readings this week highlight quite a lot is that like some of his most important interventions were 
uh, in day to day political activism and um, politicking. So uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, his well, primary contribution wasn't just capital. Not that it wasn't. Also, <laughs> I did. I did like the images that Communal paints of Marx just like doing this during the day and then just staying up all night smoking cigars and drinking, trying to like hurriedly finish capital. It's yeah. like, God, what a life. No wonder this guy had carbuncles all over the place and had to go yeah, to market yeah. was and relax. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What was he doing? Just telling people he'd gone away on holiday or something, so that <laughs> he's just in his room, he could, like get some work done. <laughs> Yeah, that's incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you're absolutely right to bring up this point, and this kind of gets to Kamlinal's whole thesis, right? About like it is developing the classes' capabilities so that they can then emancipate themselves, right? And you know, to to be like simplistic about it or whatever, it's the Hal Draper, it's the socialism from above, socialism from below. Like Marx did all of this work to develop, you know, sociology as a branch and to develop historical materialism to show that like. You can't just play lip service to these ideas. You can't just pay lip service to the ideas that the working class is the universal emancipator. So I'm just going to take control of the state and do it for him. You know what I mean? And he shows why you can't do this and all this stuff. So this is kind of one of the reasons I thought it would be good to read this is because I always wondered, like, what is it about the IWA, the first international that made Marx spend a lot of his time, you know, like uh, uh, organizing with it? Um, what makes it different from what we would call like a, like a Leninist or like even just like a typical working class political party now. And it is, it is, you know, it's mainly these few things, right? It's, uh, engaging in class politics, but it's also understanding that it is the class that's going to emancipate itself. So it's just doing your best to, um, develop its capabilities as like an end, basically, you know, obviously you need to agitate and you need to propagandize. And as we'll see when we talk about all the different factions in the um, international, you need to like hold your ground and do a lot of politicking to make sure you like maintain hegemony with these ideas. But um, it is first and foremost about, you know, helping the class help itself. And that's the fascinating thing about this being a like legitimately working class um, institution and that it was started by the working class. I think one of the main reasons it was started, Communal talks about, was and this shows why it had this internationalist character was to try and get um, to try and organize the proletariat internationally to stop capitalists from importing scabs from different countries. Right. It's like, OK, there are a bunch of people on strike in London. Let's just go get a bunch of goddamn poor French people to come over here and work for half their right. Right. So if you organize proletariat on both sides of these international borders, they can't do that. And that's a huge blow against capital. So good stuff and you know just on the last thing on that is you can kind of see how that would be helpful now not so much that there are like international scabs although you know you see obviously development of things like nafta so that a cheap workforce can cross international borders more so just like you know your your computer and all of this your clothes and all of this shit gets produced by people who you have a vested interest in um maybe not when it comes to like price or whatever but you have a vested interest in being organized because if we're going to do socialism it has to be everybody. So it's good. Yeah. One of the most interesting things about this history in some respects is that the conditions were really not there in favor of an effective sort of like internationalist organization, like the political tendencies, but also the economic situation in all of these different countries um, were wildly different. And we'll get onto that in a minute, like Comunino really makes a point of taking us through the history and taking us through the sort of economic history which is something we really love to do um and uh (laughs) sort of points out all of these differences um but you're right as you say like it was the sort of like it was this degree of solidarity between the working classes of various different countries that was shared on various different um i guess what you'd call like foreign affairs questions right like there's the civil war in the u.s there's the sort of like campaign for independence in Ireland and the sort of like ongoing oppression of the Irish. Um, the There's also like the, the unification of Germany, which is sort of like soon to happen, but more pressing at the time of its founding was like the unification in Italy, but also like um, uh, independence movements in Poland and this kind of thing. So there were all of these overarching uh, foreign policy questions, which the working class were saying, no, we have opinions on and we're ad- advancing into this globalist age i guess we are we are in the sort of like 
the first stage of um, full-blown capitalist free trade, right? Like the free trade movement has sort of sort of like um, won the day in Britain and won this period of like uh, free trade politics. And so there's probably a an, 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 uh, knock-on effect of that where, okay, we're now advancing into this globalist globalized market. Um, our labor now touches all of these places um, and we now sort of like have some kind of solidaristic outlook toward these ongoing struggles. And then the other thing he points out is that there really is between the working classes of all of these countries, uh, a shared collection of sentiments and demands and attitudes towards um, political and democratic rights that they think they are all owed. One of the things that really ties um, all of these people together is a commitment to a series, a set of um, political and social rights. Um, and maybe that's one of the things that we could really look to today when we live in such a sort of like globalized world, but where the, where the rights um, that we all have are in some ways quite disparate or um, where we might look inwards and say, we want to advantage ourselves, our own consumptive abilities by accepting a certain uh, degradation of the working classes in other countries. We can either take that attitude, attitude or we can say um, we are going to be solidaristic toward the working classes of other countries. Um, and that's sort of a pivotal point, I suppose, we're at similar to that time, I guess. Yeah. And, and also, too, just like how, on a practical level, how do you respond to the very different, as you say, like material circumstances and struggles of, you know, back then, just like people with somebody in Kent and somebody like 30 miles away in France. Right. He, he gives the explanation of like uh, the proletariat struggle in Ireland is very different than it is in England and it's very different than it is in Poland. And obviously it's very different than it is in America. Right. Um so just on like a systems level, how do you organize all of that momentum? And it would seem to be the answer here is to have a minimum set of like uh, demands or what, not demands, but like, you know, I forget what they call them. Rules is what they call them. It was just like, they're kind of, you know, here's what we believe or whatever. And then don't just pay lip service to trying to organize uh, for the betterment of everybody. Like actually, actually do it. Actually show that, hey, if we organize the proletariat in France, it'll mean better wages for them. And it will also mean less scabs in England, right? So um, just on a practical level, like how do you respond to the almost overdetermination of class struggle, which is something very much that we need to deal with now where it's like the class struggle isn't just determined by, um, you know, showing up to work every day. It's also like militant policing and ghettos and stuff like this and blah, 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 blah. So you know, this internationalist outlook certainly comes close to showing you how you should deal with that. Um, one thing I also kind of want to touch on before we get too into it is there's this quote here where Marx is reading, uh, Marx is writing a letter to Engels and they're kind of mulling over the international, right? I think that's what's going on here. And they're basically talking about how much the class struggle has changed since 1848, the like high hopes of 1848 or whatever. And Marx says it was very difficult to frame the thing so that our views should appear in a form that would make it acceptable to the present outlook of the workers' movement. It will take some time before the revival of the movement allows for the old boldness of language to be used. And then that's the end of that quote. But then Comnenal says, um, Yet that this clearly was no rebirth of the old revolutionary politics did not prevent Marx from interpreting the fact that the meeting was chock full as a sign that there was evidently a new revival in the working classes taking uh, place. So I think that that kind of shows a couple different things. First of all, it, it shows that Marx was completely open to tailoring his language and his um, organizational, I don't know, hobbies or whatever, practices, I guess, uh, to the level at which the workers movement was at, which I think is something that's really fascinating. And, you know, it's easy to show up to like strikes and be like, uh, but have you considered getting rid of all of the managers and instituting workers councils? But it's another thing to be like, oh, here's how you can kind of like get better wages. Here's how you do all of this. Well, you know where like that issue comes from. Well, it's actually having a wage to begin with in the first place, blah, 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 blah. So I, I just thought that was interesting and worth touching on that Marx was at first kind of skeptical of, using the old language old like 16 years ago or whatever it was um to a workers movement that might not have been ready but then also being surprised that like oh maybe it is ready <laughs> maybe i'm maybe the kids are right i'm buying the times 
Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? It's not really a. Um, I, I guess I would be inclined to think about it not really as a a growing degree of uh, consciousness, I suppose, or like a progressing toward sort of like a revolutionary consciousness, so much as actually having proper answers to the political questions of the day kind of thing if if the question that's being posed by present society isn't a revolutionary one um coming in with some piece of revolutionary rhetoric is really just going to alienate people from um what you're trying to do and really what you're trying to do is um speak to their concerns but sort of help them realize them at the same time um which is what's going on here but um Sort of again, commonly, you know, this is coming back to a point you were just making about the sort of like the the rules or the principles of this institution, right? That's one of the ways in which Marx made a real impact on this was being party to the writing of these rules and writing into them this idea that the intention of the international was to build working working class political organization with a view to building political power, I suppose, or conquering political power. Uh, I say that because. It's important to remember that Marx, again, was never intentionally being reformist or revolutionary um, and was able to be revolutionary in his reformism um, and maybe the other way around, reformist in his revolutionariness in the sense that, like, um, he wasn't an anarchist, right? He wasn't, he, he I mean, the big um, flare up in this whole history is between him and Bakunin over this question of uh what is a uh, proper how how fully to engage with politics i guess uh, or the sort of the the question of um, organizing for political power um so yeah marx never one or the other but sort of a synthesis of both proper to the time that he's writing in I, yeah i think that's i think that's really well said it is it, it again it comes back to like one of the first ideas we came across in the show of like reformer revolution maybe you're actually just asking the wrong question mm -hmm. um and it, it requires a certain amount of like being an adult and uh who's the guy i think it's i think it's john boyd general intellect unit did some episodes on him he's like a military strategist and he came up with he's like a systems theorist guy he came up with the oodle loop or whatever <laughs> which is like, I'm going to fuck it up, but it's something like when you're trying to figure out how to strategize and how to act, you need to um, like observe, orient, decide, act, something like that. And it's like, yeah, you need to constantly be doing that. You need to constantly be saying, what's our terrain? How are things looking? What approach do we need to have? And then going, here's what we need to do. And then going boom, 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 and doing it. And then doing that again in a cycle, constantly observing, constantly trying to figure out where you are, deciding and acting. And I think that a lot of left movements now, and you know, probably also the first international got caught up in not doing that. They got caught up in either sectarianism or just like ideological purity and stick to one plan and it just fucks up because you're not able to kind of put your ego to the side and be like, okay, well, what actually do we need to do? What does the situation call for? Um, so on that, let's let's get into some of these schmucks, other factions. Um, mm. You were saying right before this that you've gained a huge amount of respect for Proudhon and that you're now a mutualist, <laughs> I believe is what you were just saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Pierre, Pierre Joseph Proudhon, uh, <laughs> famous um, misogynist and anti-Semite. So yeah, famous nice for... guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't so much a respect as an understanding. Okay. Um, <laughs> Because what this really does answer is a question that I'd never really asked myself, but realized it was in my mind every time I dealt with this period of uh, history, the history of the socialist movement, is whether it was truly the case that these ver various countries that were involved were primarily talking about Britain, uh, France, and Germany, but obviously there were other countries involved in this international as well. But the way it's always presented is that all of these countries were led by various political traditions or ideological traditions and key thinkers. Um, so when the international was founded, the, the, the primary ideological group within it were people uh, inspired by Proudhon, um, Marx and Marxists, who there were probably none in 1864, maybe two, <laughs> maybe one. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Um, Mar Marxists or people sharing Marxist politics were in a sort of like uh, small minority but of course Marx made himself 
really important to this institution um and his ideas were influential upon it um but I sort of always is it yeah is it really true that all of these countries fell down these lines um and why was it that they were so different right why did certain political traditions speak to different countries or different uh, working classes of different countries and not others um and the answer is really obvious actually when uh, Comnino goes through it it's like well all of these different countries were at different stages of capitalism like he points out that britain was the most advanced capitalist country there were certain political traditions there were certain economic traditions there were certain uh determining factors that influenced the way the working class engaged with um the bourgeoisie engaged with the class struggle compared to france who effectively wasn't even a fully capitalist country at this point and we can get onto that in a minute um and also germany that started out didn't even become a unified nation until 1871 but by 1914 had outstripped britain in its sort of like productive capacity i think is one of the things that common says so um germany advances rapidly from being sort of like pre-capitalist to sort of like the predominant productive european power britain capitalist all the way through this century and france in this process of almost mixing these two traditions together in some ways do you think that's a fair description of uh, yeah i think so yeah. and i i think also that um there are kind of a number of different things too this is a, a pretty short essay so he doesn't get into it too much but there are a number of different things that kind of determined the um at least w which socialist political current seems to be the most prevalent in the uh, iwa and he, he, the one he goes into the most is France. Surprise, surprise. This is the guy that like spent his, you know, I'm not going to say life, but like a large part of his life studying France and the development of capitalism there to basically say why mutualism showed up there. And it is what you're saying. It's like different stages of development in capitalism, but we also don't want to fall into the trap of being like, well, they're eventually all going to get to this one point of capitalism because he makes the point, And I'm not certain I really fully understand what he was saying here, but at least the bit where he says, um, that peasants' rights were actually strengthened after the French Revolution. And so that led to like a completely different dynamic that didn't exist in England where peasants' rights were just like trotted on and just binned and never <laughs> gotten back really at all in any meaningful way. And that, you know, different things like that and the kind of like regional respect of uh, workers' rights without necessarily having collective bargaining as an official thing as led to this kind of individualism of the worker, which then led to mutualism. Um, so there are, yeah, there are like a number of different material um, things that led to this, <laughs> that led to these political currents, you know, it was interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah he does. He says that, um, as you say, like, there was this tradition in France that continued to respect the rights and autonomy of the worker, whereas uh, sort of like capital um, Britain, the most sort of like enough sort of like almost fully developed form of capitalism um its economics have developed to the point where the laborer the worker was fully subordinated to uh the sort of bourgeois let's sort of factory owner or what have you um who was able to dictate under what conditions the worker worked whereas in france the the worker sort of like maintained a lot more power um one of the things it says that proudhon was um really opposed to sort of like political organization in general and also like the tactic of strikes in particular whereas in britain we know like um uh the british workers fought for the right to combine they formed illegal trade unions and then they were given the right to form unions and that's what they did um they continued to sort of strike for uh better wages and conditions um and therefore the sort of like the the British tr political tradition became defined by this political history of trade unionism up until the point where all of the working classes or the majority of the working classes' uh, political energies were all directed into their trade unions, right? They were really committed to their trade unions. But one of these peculiar sort of like um, features of british politics is that there never was a working class political party or a substantial working class political party 
in Britain until the trade unions formed one in like 1900 and 1901 or whatever it was, they formed the Labour Party. But before that, they just worked through the Liberal Party um, and they really didn't see forming a political party as being a really important part of what they were trying to do because what they'd been trained in through the class struggle was um, directing their politics through trade unionism kind of thing, whereas there wasn't that tradition at all in France. And so it makes sense that sort of like Proudhonist mutualism something which um, sort of like what you might call like market socialism, I suppose, something that really recognized the autonomy of the worker in a con- under conditions where people were still, there was a lot more sort of like artisanal uh, sort of like handicraft work that was going on kind of thing. It spoke much more to the economic and political conditions, but also traditions of uh, France, I suppose. Yeah, which is, it makes you think about what, what that could possibly mean for now, right? Because I'm not, I, I feel like it's almost impossible to really fully understand the moment that you're living through ever. I don't know if there's some like greater philosophical reason for that or not. But like when you look back on it and you go, oh, wow, it seems actually pretty easy. Maybe it's just because he has more info. It seems pretty easy to like do a material analysis of why mutualism opposed here. But it's like, if you even think about trying to do that, I feel like, like, well, what potentially would like Chinese workers be more open to? You know, or what would like Dutch workers be more open to? I don't know. It seems like a tall order. Hopefully someone's out there doing that. Let us know. Um, yeah, perhaps. Hmm. But I think also the probably the lesson of this is actually that capitalism has conquered the world. Yeah. And the sort of like conditions that we exist under are now much more similar between countries, basically all over the world. Um, the working class exists in a similar relationship to uh, the bourgeoisie, I suppose. Maybe there are places where you still have a kind of 19th century relationship where you actually interact with the bourgeois owner <laughs> on a more regular basis, where obviously, like, uh, my sense anyway is in the sort of like more advanced Western economies, you have a, it's much more difficult to recognize those class lines kind of thing. So there are these sort of, there are potentially differences, but compared to this time period, um, there is a lot more grounds for uh, a recognition of a shared condition, I suppose. Yeah. Well, then I, I suppose then you're, you're right. But then I would say that the contradiction then might come between the working class, how they relate to each other and not necessarily the bourgeoisie, because it's like, yeah, everybody's a wage laborer, right? There's still like a peasant population in India and, and you know, some other places. But um, the ways in which, may, I don't know if it's a quantitative thing or if it's a qualitative thing, but it would be, it, one would assume that when we're talking about socialism, the wants and needs of somebody working in a sweatshop in Bangladesh to just export t-shirts would be very different. Or like someone who may, who works in a mine uh, that produces like 80% of the world's like cobalt or something like that to be exported would be very different um, from like us assholes. You know what Mm -hmm. I'm saying? Even if the ends would be relatively the same. Um, But that might even just be more of an ecological question as well. But still the ways in which the working class relates to each other, uh, one would imagine would be quite, tricky to get around but sure. um yeah so that's Proudhon it, uh, the stuff about being anti-strike is just like oh man that's just terminally French it's like come on man what are you <laughs> talking about it's like I get it I you obviously see what he's saying about like we don't even want to engage with the capitalists on the level of struggle <laughs> on their terms but it's like come on <laughs> it's like Mark what does Mark say he says strikes are not the means uh, to complete emancipation of the working class, they are frequently, in, but they are frequently a necessity in the actual situation of the struggle between labor and capital. And it's like, yeah, okay, these struggles might not be socialist or whatever. They might not have the workers' council dudes, but it's like, don't be a prick. Put your money where your mouth is and like actually help out because this does develop capabilities and consciousness or whatever. So what are you going to do? Um, I don't know how much we want to talk about the rest of them. Uh, Blanqui, we've talked about quite a bit on the show, friend of the show, Auguste Blanqui, and all of the many Blanquists that are still out there. Basically just a vanguard, complete like vanguardism. If people talk about Leninism as a vanguard party, baby Blanqui, mm. that's what I'm talking about. Just to get the boys together and just do a revolution. I love it. Yeah, there's a nice quote from Engels in this where he says that uh, Blanqui is like a socialist in sentiment. Yeah. Like he is, he is... Um, moved by the suffering of the well the quote is the people but like the working class shall we say or whatever um but really doesn't actually have a uh worked out revolutionary theory is is his criticism kind of thing it is have fun 
just have fun have some revolutionary fun you know just LARP. which is yeah 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 which is worth remembering as another version of like socialism from above right it sort of like uh disempowers the working class um, yeah very much so yeah. <laughs> and then we'll just do socialism but, but, but hopes there will just they're sort of like um they will just see well uh, but it, it also like it's sort of it's sort of like it's just a poor strategy in the sense that it, ex it expects them because they're kind of, i guess it because it, rec it thinks of them as being sort of like auton automata right or like um they'll just like see the writing on the wall or they're sort of like programmed to react in a certain way by conditions that you just sort of like offer them the revolution and they'll jump at it kind of thing whereas um sort of like marxist historical materialism would look at it in a different way and say no you sort of like have to develop the working class to be in the condition position where they can sort of like seize and prosecute revolution rather than just like accepting it being given to them i guess yeah and one of the ways when you do that is through baby steps like things like strikes mm -hmm. baby steps as if that's not like an incredibly difficult thing to organize but you know baby steps it the, the discussion of blanky and also bakunin reminded me uh i went back to the first um Endnotes journal, Dove's first essay. Don't know why I fucking did this, but I remember that there was a bit in there where he talks about the state in relation to um, uh, the anarchist revolutions in Spain in the 1930s, and he he makes the point where he says something along the lines of like anarchists, but also Marxists tend to fetishize the state as existing at a specific space in at a specific place in space. If that makes sense, like there it is, there's the state, as if you can just take control of the fucking railways and the parliament buildings, and then the state will be gone. And he says, well, that's absolutely not true. It doesn't matter if it's a red state or a state waving a black flag. The state is a guarantor of a certain set of social relations. It doesn't matter if you've like taken over the building or whatever. And that's like just Blanchism to a T, right? It's like, oh, wow. Okay, great. Like the flag on this building has changed. And obviously it would be a bit more than that. But as this is where you get the whole communizer, just do the revolution on the first day thing. Otherwise it won't work. But like, yeah, if you don't change the social relations that give rise to the state, because the state comes after that, it's determined by the social relations. You're going to have a bad time because the state doesn't determine, <laughs> you know, the mode yeah. of production or whatever. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. yeah, it sort of reminds me of um, when we were talking about theory and cybernetics and the requirement for a sort of management function, right? Like there sort of needs to be a state function like it can't it, it is a thing which like fulfills a certain number of outcomes you know with a purpose in mind it's like it is a system um it's not like just a series of institutions as you say kind of thing that's uh there's a system behind it i suppose i do like imagining though that there are blankiest now we've talked about this before <laughs> but it's just like it's like i will take on the local police force that has tanks and the national guard that has planes that will drop bombs yeah. on me and i will well, just do the revolution all the blankiest are on the right right they're like sure yeah they're, they're yeah like, it's january 6th like militias yeah yeah <laughs> interesting they've been reading their august blankiest yeah <laughs> Well, that's, that's enough. Wow, you're certainly right about that. Yeah, um, but, it, but it also speaks to the sort of development in, in sort of like uh, political and economic traditions, such that certain uh, ideological positions have been consigned to history because history has moved on. I suppose, and, and only the relevant. stupidest chuds on the planet still believe in <laughs> yeah. some of them. Even though it does sound fun, and that's why you do it, right? Is because it just sounds fun. But there's a reason ninety nine percent of those guys are all feds because they've all been picked up. So what are you going to do? Um, who do we want to? Who do we want to save until last? Do we want to talk about. I feel like we should probably talk about Bakunin last because it's Bakunin. And that's kind of what all this revolves around. But there's also LaSalle and the Salianism. Obviously, LaSalle died. Um, I don't exactly remember what year, but pretty early on, if not before the first international started. I'm actually not certain. Regardless, the. Um, influence of his thought permeated quite a bit of this and obviously it was like all over socialist politics in germany um and there's not too much else to say other than in that it's what we talked about when we did our critique of the gotha program episode in that it's perhaps putting a bit too much trust in the state um and it's it, it's it's not quite a similar thing as the blankism prudonism anarchism thing but it's um you know lasalle worked with the kaiser right and it's like he we will bring about socialism together and it's like huh, how's that going what's the spd up to these days <laughs> yeah i mean it's interesting that we go from the point of like um the the sort of like 
influence of German socialism on this institution being minimal in the 1860s and 1870s, getting to the point where, um, as you say, like German social democracy is the model upon which all or the majority of socialist organizing in Europe yeah. is, is is done by whatever 1914 or even before 1900. And in some ways that speaks to what I was saying before about the rapid advance of uh, German capitalism, I suppose, also brought with it and it's sort of like the most advanced, I suppose, political party and political representation of the working class. He said there are a few interesting things said about the Saal, I suppose. Um, one of the things he says is that, like, as we were just saying, like, the Saal is something of a nationalist, right? And so he's interested in achieving a unified Germany, but also is interested in um, pallying up with um, Bismarck, I suppose, and attempting to help Bismarck with his social reforms. But then it's interesting, it's the other way. Bismarck is quite interested in allying with people on the left to achieve certain outcomes as well. Um, and I just sort of wonder whether maybe this is too sort of like economically determinist or teleological or something, but I wonder whether there's something in a degree of immaturity in the development of German capitalism at the time that those sort of fault lines, as we would recognize them further in history, haven't really been drawn yet. And so there is this ambiguity and there is, there is also this question of Maybe we can make an appeal to authority coming from La Salle, I suppose. Um, a, sort, a sort of like naive idea that hasn't been quashed yet, I guess. I don't know. Well, I think it also is probably framed a lot by um, the unification of Germany, right? Yeah. And because like it's easy to look back with like our, you know, what happened in the 20th century goggles on and be like, oh, it's, oh mm -hmm. boy, this isn't going anywhere good. But the unification of Germany, I would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say was like a just a right wing thing, just like a nationalist right wing thing. I, especially if you're like a guy from Prussia, right? I don't necessarily know enough about this to really say one way or the other. But I could see a way in which a logic might say it's it's almost the rising tides thing, right? Where it's like, hey, if Germany was united and we could put all of our power together, just imagine how much better our lot would be on the world stage, and thus for the working class. I, you know, again, I don't want to say that that's what LaSalle was arguing for, but like you, you could see the argument being made when it's like France has done its big revolution. Paris has conquered the rest of France. England has always just kind of been England or whatever. Um, Italy is doing whatever Italy is doing. Hey, what about us? You know, we all kind of speak a relatively similar language. Maybe we should all be together and kick out those goddamn Austrians. They can't be a part of it. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. In the, yeah. in the, in the mid 19th century, it was the done thing, right? You have a, you have a yeah. nation state. Yeah. <laughs> But like, yeah. I think the the important like uh, political uh, disagreement on the left was whether to unify under Prussian power or whether to to not let Prussia be in the lead in the process of unification, but like share that the power between all of the German states. I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was yeah. Marx's objection. According, according to Communal, was he objected to Prussia lead, leading the way in that. Yeah. And that, and that kind of, that's, this all serves Marx's disagreement with all of this kind of using the state stuff serves as a um, good foil for talking in about anarchism, I guess, because mm -hmm. it Marx wasn't necessarily in the middle of these two uh, debates, but he certainly uh, didn't agree with either of them about political action. Okay. I'm, I'm kind of hoping that you can kind of enlighten me a little bit here. I'll admit to not being much of a Bakunin head and just, I've never read anything Bakunin's written. All I've ever heard is really just like Marxists talk about Bakunin. Maybe we should get an actual anarchist to come on here and talk about Bakunin, but I'm a bit at a loss <laughs> about what his plan was after reading this, because I've always been under the impression that the idea of a socialist political party as such wouldn't really come about that we think of it now, right? Wouldn't really come about until like the SPD really got going, right? And that back then when we, it's a common misconception to think, well, Bakunin didn't want a political party and Marx wanted a political party. When it's like, well, maybe when they say political action, that's not actually what they meant. They didn't actually mean a mo the German social democratic model, right? That's more of like a Kautskyist, Babelist, Leninist thing. That's always been my understanding. It's my understanding of when Bakunin and Marx are disagreeing about using political action or in, in intervening politically to build up the working classes capability 
to intervene for itself politically. Like what that meant is just kind of like getting involved with things like, I don't know, different, I suppose, like measures that were being passed or laws or something like that. But it didn't necessarily mean a political party as such it, because they're in the international. That's not a political party. But when Bakunin says he's not interested in political organizing and then has this whole thing about inheritance, it's like, what the fuck are you talking about? It's like, you can't have one or the other. You got to either, you know, have all of these ideas where it's like, nope, we're not even going to touch the capitalist state. This is going to be entirely outside of politics, which I, again, I don't understand because what is outside of politics? We're not going to get involved in government or anything like that. Uh, but also we would like to see measures passed to quash inheritance. I don't, I just don't get it. I don't really understand really what's going on here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think I learned a huge amount about Bakunin from reading this. <laughs> yeah. um, I thought it was interesting at the beginning, there's a quote from Mark saying that he's quite impressed with Bakunin when he first meets him in 18, not when he first meets him, because I think he'd met him in 1848, but like on re-familiarizing uh, himself with Bakunin in 1864, he's actually very, he's like, he's quite impressed with Bakunin. And he said, oh, I think he said, says to Engels, he's one of the people he's come across who's matured the most or developed the most since 1848. Not gotten backwards. Not gone backwards. Is that what he said? <laughs> um, the way, I mean, the way I understand this disagreement, I suppose, is the question of the difference between having an insurrectionary politics or having a politics which is, um, more, I guess, what we'd recognize as Marxist or, um, yeah, Marxist, I suppose, in the sense of like uh, building up working class capacity to at some point be able to um, institute a revolution and institute uh, working class control of society, um, sort of transform the state. I don't know, like, I. I, I reluctant to use the phrase dictatorship of the proletariat but institute the dictatorship of the proletariat but i think the question of politics in this context is the idea that that needs development it needs to develop the capacities of the working class and it needs the, the working class to develop its political institutions to be able to do that um and bakuninism is much more predicated on uh insurrection i suppose in a way similar to blanquism i guess um expecting a certain spontaneous um, reaction from the working classes or, or from the proletarian classes, I guess. I mean, I don't know what to say about the question of inheritance. What does he say? that he, One of his one of the policies he wants is an, uh, just the total abolition of inheritance. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it seems like a reasonably acceptable it's revolutionary fine. demand to me <laughs> yeah i suppose i suppose though that was like his one of his main things right that was like his you know goal number one end inheritance that will bring us to anarchism and marx was saying like well anarchism or not anarchism inheritance only matters because of the power that capital holds over society right so it's yeah. like if you get rid of the power of capital who gives a fuck about inheritance that won't matter at all well, and that, so you know yeah i mean but that's 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 the Marxist criticism of the anarchist approach to the state, right? Like, you, the anarchists um, see the state as the, the the villain of history, the thing to be overcome, authority, uh, without recognizing that what we have is a capitalist state, and you'd have to overcome capitalism to overcome this form of state, or at least anarchists of this period. Clearly, there are, uh, I guess, what you'd call or what are called class struggle anarchists who um, recognize how important a criticism of capitalism is to um, a revolutionary radical politics. I mean, Murray Bookchin would be one. So King. King Murray Bookchin. Come on the show. <laughs> so Murray before, Bookchin. just just in case anybody's listening for the first time and thinks we're really <laughs> like uh, down on this anarchism thing, <laughs> we have our favorite anarchists, you know, it's fine. We do. As, yeah. as one of my best friends should, is an anarchist. Everybody should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, so, yeah. So then, then the uh, IWA falls apart, right? The first international falls apart, and it falls apart partly because the anarchists led by Bakunin just fuck off, and they go, "We're going to start our own international," and it goes nowhere. And then the first international, the Red International, or whatever, relocates to New York, and then it also falls apart, uh, seemingly just because. And I, I, I think. Two things that I kind of want to say. One, one is that the 
the lack of interest in expelling people, at least at first, and from splitting and from purifying their, you know, perfect political organization or whatever, um, it it seems like the right way to go. And it seems like a sacrifice that Marx made to be serious about opening the IWA and that, you know, not just Marx, everybody was part of it, opening the IWA to everybody and to all working class walks of life. And you can kind of see this as an argument for variety, right? But what comes along with that is the need to like politic and to try and have your ideas be hegemonic. And in this ultimately, as much as I hate to say it, like Marx and the Marxists, quote unquote, fail, right? And it's important to know that like nobody was using the term Marxist. Nobody was really using the term anarchist at all. These were just different factions. But the second thing I do kind of want to say is that this <laughs> this was a disaster. I'm not going to say that like the first international could have done socialism or whatever, but this did precipitate a split that would that lasts until now where it's like us the enlightened communists and them this the silly anarchist socialism in one street corner anarchists right and that's just been a fucking disaster for the working class movement um if if we are serious about wanting to rebuild working class power you i think again even though it might not have really worked out exactly the way everybody wanted it to. You do need to have your organization be open to everybody and you can't just be like a dipshit, like 13 year old and exclude the anarchists because they're anarchists, dude. I mean, eventually if we want to talk about it, like looking forward in the second international, Hey, maybe, you know, the Marxists actually wound up putting their trust in some Lasallian organizations that didn't have their best interests at hearts. So if we play it out with game theory or whatever, but this, this split, I have a hard time, not seen as um, one of the bigger disasters in working class history. And I like to think that it wasn't just because Bakunin and Marx were both assholes, but it seems like it might have been the case. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I couldn't possibly comment on the, <laughs> the character of these two figures. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting because in one, it, you are definitely correct, right? That is the legacy of the first international is to l have lumbered us with this inexorable uh, division between the red and the black, he suppose. Um, and definitely they all unite again. Uh, at the same time, the first international was a very a fairly small organization at a point in time where uh working class political organizations were equally small and um organized political action of the working class was relatively non-existent and what it turned into i think was a theoretical struggle over what was the appropriate course of action what was the appropriate um revolutionary strategy to adopt i suppose uh, by disintegrating maybe it wasn't necessary for this to happen but what took its place was a much more um ideologically coherent uh international uh proletariat and organization i suppose the second international in some ways unfortunately made up by political parties from all of the different uh European and then also a sort of American and some other parts of the world uh, countries. So it was very much drawn on nationalistic lines, which would eventually be its undoing. But I would be inclined to argue that it was a political advance to be in the position to actually have the second international come into existence, the sort of so-called socialist international um, that could actually agree more thoroughly, at least on the surface level, agree on a, a sort of like theoretical and political outlook. Obviously, there were divisions in that, <laughs> and in some ways, that 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 theoretical um, division necessitated another break. And then you have the third international, which in some ways is that a greater uh, purification of political theory along the right course of history, or was it once again another split which alienated more people and? Um, destroyed the possibility for united uh working class political action towards socialism i really don't know i'd be interested to know how you feel about that actually because part of me is inclined to say it's good to have a certain amount of coherence on these questions um and 
purges are good. <laughs> uh -oh. uh, at the same Might time, obviously. From the <laughs> at, the, at the same time, obviously, like uh, alienating people who would otherwise be your allies um, is probably bad. I guess it ultimately comes ultimately comes down to what is the appropriate course of action at any historical juncture. Um, people have clearly important historical figures that we would think of. I'm thinking of Lenin. Um, clearly took certain political decisions thinking that they were in a certain moment of revolutionary rupture and thought it necessary to build a certain type of organization um, to advance the the world changing mission of the proletariat um, whether we now look back on those and say whether they're the right thing that's that's for us with hindsight to do but um, to criticize these people for doing these things at the time is an entirely different thing um, yeah I don't know whether I'd be willing to do that yeah I yeah I have a hard time disagreeing with anything you've said I think it's almost a pretty impossible question to answer because part of me just wants to say exactly what you're saying, which is just like, you need to constantly be reorienting yourself. And if a change is necessitated in the, your changing circumstances to your ideology or whatever, then you need to change. You can't just be left behind with this like failing ideology or whatever. But at the same time, you can make an argument that that's what Marx was doing. That's what Lenin was doing. That's what all of these different people were doing. And I have a hard time disagreeing with Marx during his time in the first international. And when it comes to the question of war credits, I have a hard time disagreeing <laughs> with Lenin, right? It's like, give me a fucking break. How, how the hell could you call yourself a socialist and then be like, hey, World War I, that's great. Like, I wouldn't want to be in, a, in an organization with those people, that's insane. So where you draw the line is impossible to answer, but you're gonna have to have a certain amount of just like gritting your teeth and burying it and being an adult because Otherwise, you get to the point where we're at now where you split and you split and you split and you split until it's just, you know, you, <laughs> you know what I mean? You can't even agree with other Trotskyists, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's, it's very difficult to know where to draw the line. All you can really do is try and organize with a group of like-minded people who you share at least some certain level of, of uh, goals with, but who are also open to adapting those goals and you also need to be as well. Um, so maybe the answer is is somehow just in systems theory, but I have a hard time understanding how you can get past people's pride when it comes to ideology because Marx and Bakunin certainly couldn't. Um, and yeah, I don't know. When it comes to the second international, quite a bit more is at stake. Um, but yeah, I don't know. What are you going to do? Guess... That's what I say. Yeah, I think maybe an important takeaway from this is to imagine looking at the this history, um, looking for the questions that were people were asking at the time. What did Marx think was the appropriate question to be asking, but perhaps not side with the answers that they took kind of thing. Like history has moved on and the answers that the various different factions of the First International were saying were proper to their time kind of thing. Um, but definitely don't fall into the trap of relitigating any of these splits, whether they're the first international, or the second international, the third international, whatever kind of thing. Like, um, if we're constantly refighting those ideological battles, then um, we're bound to failure, I suppose. Yeah, and it's it's uh, it's also important to remember that it's a means and ends thing, right? Like Marx and Bakunin w wanted both wanted a classless society, and you know. To a certain extent, it was probably relatively similar. Obviously, we can just look to the critique of the Gotha program when Marx is talking to Los Allians to see how actually different his view of socialism was from a number of different people. But for the most part, classless society is something everybody can agree on, right? And it's just a question of how you get there. And you're always going to have those disagreements, whether or not you have apply labels to it, like, well, you're an anarcho-syndicalist and I'm an anarcho-mutualist, so we'll never get along. Um, mm -hmm. You're always going to have those disagreements in actual organizing. And I think that like one thing that organizing in a very like bourgeois uh, environment recently has taught me is that like you kind of have to leave some of that at the door because like, yeah, let me be clear. I'm not organizing with communists at the moment uh, or anything really even remotely close to it, but we have fairly similar goals in the short term. And when you're in meetings with these people or when you're just in meetings with anybody, you're going to wind up disagreeing a lot. And I don't fucking know. I don't want to make this all a question of like, just be nice because that's obviously not what it is. But 
there's the question of what can you do now and what would be the perfect course of action for the entire class as a whole. And those two things are literally never going to be in tandem. So, you know, one can only hope, I guess. When I do my Blanquiest insurrection, I'll make all the right choices. <laughs> Just kidding, MI6. I will not do that. <laughs> oh, um, I think one, one thing that I wanted to say quickly was to see how you feel is that I don't know whether it's the the subheading of this communal mm. piece is to say that uh, Marx wasn't a Leninist. Mm. Um, That's and clickbait. I th <laughs> <laughs> and I think. Um, I think Comnenal has been somewhat unfair on Lenin here. I think he's taking the taking the Third International and what Lenin did post World War One, um, and comparing the sort of Third International to the third, First International, and saying that they did different things. But coming back to what I was saying before, they were in different historical periods. Clearly, they would do different things. Um, and coming back to Lars Lee's book on Lenin and what is to be done, I think. Comnino is very clearly taking um, one particular reading of what is to be done and sort of like assuming that to be Lenin's politics. Um, but I think it's probably fair to say, and we would agree Matt, perhaps that um, whether or not Marx was a Leninist doesn't really matter. But I think Lenin, for the most part, was definitely a Marxist and did definitely agree with um all of the politics that we've talked about as being Marxist politics or Marx's politics in this essay. Um, at least up until the outbreak of World War One. Yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. I, one thing I will say in the defense of Comnenal, though, is that it wasn't, he's not saying, well, maybe I'm being way too charitable here. He's saying that Marx wasn't a Leninist. He's not saying that Marx and Lenin didn't agree on all of the same stuff, right? What has it become Marxism-Leninism? Uh, maybe not what Marx wanted. <laughs> and so fuck it, who cares? Uh, what yeah, I mean, maybe, wanted, right? maybe, yeah, maybe in that context, Lenin isn't a Leninist. And exactly. Like, well, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and especially when he, for some reason, I kept thinking he was writing this in the 80s, but he was writing it like nine years ago. So it's yeah. relatively <laughs> recent. But like a lot of the people who call themselves Leninists, and this is fine, I'm not trying to be like, you're wrong, but would not have the same approach to class organizing that Marx did. And that's totally fine. It's, mm -hmm. you know, that's, you're allowed to differ. But what Marx was explicitly doing in his organizing was trying to develop the capabilities of the class in itself. And what kind of has become Leninism now is this idea of like, I don't want to use the term vanguard party, but it is, it's something along those lines of like a organized, you know, group of people who might be doing a smattering of revolution from above. But so what? Because if that's what you think, then that's fine, right? So. Is, it, is it the Marxist Leninists that are the Blanquists of today? <laughs> <laughs> everyone's a Blanquist except for me. Just like yeah. everyone's a Lasalle and everyone's a Blanquist except for me. Everybody's a liberal. <laughs> Everybody's a liberal. Everyone's a fucking Blanquist. <laughs> um, mm. Yeah, well, we figured it out. We, yeah. We've solved the. Uh, we got to the bottom of that one. We've solved 150 year old debate. <laughs> <laughs> I I really liked this, honestly. Like, if for no other reason than it it got me thinking, and um, it would be good to hear what some some Leninists think about this. Again, not trying to be like you're wrong, but just because I'd be interested to know what they think. Because again, you, you, you maybe stop calling yourself like something named after a specific person because you're not going to agree with them on everything. But um, sign signifier, all of that, it doesn't really fucking matter at all. So I don't know, whatever. Call yourself whatever you want. Yeah. I mean, I'm a true leveler. That's I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm Winstanleyist. Exactly. I'm upholding Winstanley thought, which yeah. means I'm like bordering on evangelical fascist levels of Christianity. Uh -huh. That's uh -huh. what that actually means. Mm. I went to the garden center today, Jack, and we oh, brought some you? broad beans. So. Uh, what type? We, we, Aqua dulce? Uh, I think so. They were dwarf broad beans. So. Oh, okay. You you mm. love these dwarf broad beans. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, do I? But okay, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I do. Maybe I do. <laughs> they get out of control, you know. They get a bit unwieldy. They do. I've got forty mm. plants growing at the allotment oh, right oh. now. I've been like trying to figure out what I'm going to grow. Tell you what, I'm all in on natural uh, natural inputs at the moment. I'm planning out my <laughs> FPJ F. Wait, yeah, FPJs. My IMOs. I'm I'm all I'm all there for it, baby. Um, right. We'll see. Also, <laughs> making update tea. making tea. Yeah, exactly. Making vinegar. Uh, update on uh, Horace Heresy Watch. Finished Horace Rising. It was pretty good. Mm. I get a feeling, Dan, I get the feeling that this Horace guy 
he's going to do pretty well. He's going to be, a, he's going to be <laughs> really be good. It's going to be, gonna fine. be fine. Once they get past this like minor expedition to Davin, I think it's all yeah. going to be okay. Plain sailing from that out. <laughs> <laughs> those are those are my evenings like switching between reading like esoteric george Comneal essays and like oh what's gavriel loken up to these days <laughs> uh, well hmm. all right um well spring's almost here dan this is exciting um not much else to say other than that this is you know a reminder that we don't have to live in abstract time there are in uh -huh. fact seasons are in real time yeah uh, yeah yeah. we'll go for a cold snap it's cold right now yeah, it's fucking cold i uh i built a little seed sewing box greenhouse kind of thing at the allotment recently and someone walked by and was like that's optimistic of you i was like what spring's almost here and they're like oh, right, spring's <laughs> almost here. and then two weeks later everybody's debating whether to plant their potatoes or not. I'm, I'm planting my potatoes tomorrow i don't know <laughs> yeah. see. Hmm. All right. Well, uh, yeah, that was really fun, Dan. And we'll be back again in two weeks with something else. And um, thank you. Thank you again for this, Dan. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, it's been a good one. I really enjoyed this one. Uh, nice to revisit these figures, these characters, our old friends. <laughs> um, yeah. And yeah, as you say, we'll be back in a few weeks with something equally exciting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See ya. All right. Bye bye. The music you heard this episode was Music to Kill Bad People To by King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. If you like this song, you can check it out and much, much more on their Bandcamp at kinggizzard.bandcamp.com. Be sure and follow us up on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you like what you heard, be sure and tune in next week for some more commie discussion. Till next time. Oh, my God.